All right, welcome back everybody. This is instructor Phil Dimitriotis and we are going to finish the last leg of our perspective lecture. We did one point and two point and this is now three point and I have to promote, I do have a detailed perspective class here called Applied Perspective. We have not even covered half of what that class covers in terms of understanding how light works, how shadows work, what's the difference between artificial light, natural light, what's the difference, what happens when you have three-point perspective, four-point perspective, all these other forms of perspective and the way that we see and view things. So for today, I'm gonna to finish off this lecture. This is three-point perspective. What is three-point perspective used for? Okay, so I have a list. One of the things I like to do is go back and examine from my professional experience of drawing and designing for animation, for games and other stuff, I like to come back and share with you when do I use my, pers my uh, given perspectives for different types of framing shots. So three-point perspective is commonly used for establishing shots. It's a great way to look out over a horizon and see a tremendous amount of information, okay? It's also used for staging and storyboarding for having what we call bird's eye shots where we're up high and we're looking down on an army or we're traveling over somebody, okay? Again, that's a three point shot. Another point of view would be a, a down low shot, which is also re when the camera excuse me, also referred to as a worm's eye view when the camera is stationed down very, very low on top of a dedicated horizon line and the camera is tilted looking up. And by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you samples of course with this. And I'm also gonna show you a couple sample in a couple minutes of what not to do, okay? Also, three point perspective is used for discovery. If you can imagine somebody coming through a series of bushes or trees and they open up a bush and they're standing on a cliff and they're looking down over a whole entire valley of a new civilization that nobody has seen before, okay? Discovery is key for storyboarding and for conceptual art, all right? Another indication, scale and transition. In three-point perspective, not only do we have a transfer of scale and a transition of height relationships happening left to right, we also have them going vertically, up and down, okay? Yes, sir, question? Yeah, it's recording. It's recording, no worries, thanks for checking in. I would hate to give a lecture and find out it's not recording, right? Because you guys can watch it. All right, so outside of scale and transition, more interesting angles, what does that mean? We get used to seeing the world in one point and two point by going into three point that allows us to convey a little bit more to the viewer and we get to see something that looks a little bit more exciting, okay? Which leads us to something called a Dutch tilt, okay? Now, a Dutch tilt, also part of an action pose, let's talk about where that comes from, okay? The, the old phrase of Dutch tilt actually came from when the Dutch used to take a ship over here to the United States Okay, they would get off, they would come to trade, and you're rocking on a boat that's going left and right, and people will get off the boat, and they're walking with a little bit of a tilt to them. Hence came the Dutch tilt, and you'd see things a little bit differently, okay? In action scenes, you can still have a drawing in two-point perspective that's tilted on a Dutch tilt. The difference is, is whether or not the length of the frame. Is the frame a vertical pan? Once you go into a vertical pan or you have a vertical frame or you're moving the camera, you're going to have to transition then into a three-point perspective shot if that makes sense. I'll show you in a couple minutes. But if you can imagine two-point perspective shot, slightly tilted, but with a vertical frame where you're panning from start A to start B, you then have a three-point perspective, all right? And something else to talk about a little bit more advanced here. Three-point perspective exists in five-point perspective fear. It's fear. I can't talk today, man. What's going on with me? Okay, so a three-point shot is really a camera or frame that you are drawing for the viewer that exists inside part of a five-point perspective sphere. And I'm going to give you a quick example of that right now. We are all on the planet Earth, right? So you are drawing somebody that is on a five-point sphere. The difference is with that sphere is the transition of the scale and the height relationships and subject matter to the frame and the size. The majority of time in film, you are not close, the, the subject matter is not super small, okay, where you see that five-point sphere unless 
A good example of that would be if you happen to be Luke Skywalker and you're flying a TIE fighter and you're coming in, not a TIE fighter, but an X-Wing fighter, right? And you're flying into the Death Star. Then you're going to see the world in five point perspective because you're coming in at a low angle, entering a sphere. See, there's a difference on the scalability and the size relationships of objects, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Common problems. Major problems, the three point perspective is the technical usage. If it's not used correctly, it's going to result in, number one, total distortion of subject matter because your subject matter is too large and it's not small enough and you don't understand anything about scale and transition. Tran Why can't I talk today? And transition, okay? And um, what ends up happening is you end up having your, the world too large existing inside the vanishing points and you get what we call the fanning effect. I'll show you examples in just a minute, okay? All right, so that was next. The fan effect of the subject matter. Fanning, distorted. The subject matter is too large inside your world, okay? I know someone in this class is going to skip over my lecture and I'm going to track you down with a cattle prod, okay, and shock you because you need to pay attention to that size. It has to be smaller. Next theme, extreme transition of scale. In three-point perspective, we talked about this going left or right or up and down. You have a giant transfer of scale. Things get small very, very quickly, okay? Placement of vanishing points are too close from different directions will destroy the drawing. That is an example between a pro and a non-pro. A non-pro who's just learning it, which I gotta be honest, when I look out on YouTube, 90% of the videos are from non-pros and they're like, here's three point, here's a point here, a point there. They're going over stuff they learned from a book, but they've never had to apply it inside a drawing. Pros that have to apply it inside a drawing, whether it be storyboarding, concept art, or whatever, they know how it works and they know how the rules work. They know how to use it in their favor. That's one of the big differences, okay? When used successfully, it's a great tool, okay? It is. It gives you a different angle, makes things look very cool. It's also for action-based compositions that create interest. If, you, if something's about to happen, like people are about to fight, people are flying a bunch of TIE fighters chasing each other, you better have a little bit of a tilt on there and you can have it in three point. It makes it extremely interesting. Most of the time when you're watching films, you don't even notice that it went into three point because you're so engulfed with the character and the staging with the camera angles and the transitions of what's happening in that story, you don't realize what is taking place. Okay, so next. Let's take a look. We have a total of about uh, 28 slides to look at total, okay? All right, why is it not transitioning? Here we go. Here's what not to do, okay? So I looked around online, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody, and this is your image, I do apologize, but there's a problem with this in three point. The problem is, is the subject matter's too large, okay? When the subject matter's too large and the vanishing points are too close, so look, one point is right here on my right. One point is right here on my left. One point, the third point, is receding down here to the bottom. It's about three inches past my Cintiq. What's the problem with that? That's the fan effect. Everything's fanned out. It's totally distorted. Go for the price behind door number two. It's not drawn correctly. It looks horrible. It's, it doesn't look right, okay? All right, let's take a look at another one, okay? What's the problem in this piece? The problem in this piece is the horizon line is too high and the frame isn't vertical enough where we can't see enough of the compression of the building. We can't see the transfer of scale. So let me draw with my little cursor here. If this was reframed going this way and the frame went up much higher, we'd be able to see the transition of the building converging away from us. In this shot, you look at it and your eye probably goes, well, why do the buildings have to be distorted like that? They don't have to be. There's not enough of a third, uh, excuse me, there's not enough of an angled shot on there to imply that there's enough transition. The problem with that is the placement of the vanishing points. So the answer is yes to one of the questions I was just asked right before this lecture, which is in three-point perspective, can we switch to a vertical frame? The answer is yes, you can. A lot of times you have to, why? We're gonna cover that in a second here, because it shows more transition. It allows more space for convergence happening. Convergence is when an object is transferring in scale from the foreground 
to, let's say, the midground or background, and it is converging to that third vanishing point. Hence, if you have a horizontal frame like this, it's going to be harder to get convergence to happen. You have to switch to a vertical frame on some instances. Okay, next, let's take a look over here. All right, the world is melting. Okay, so this is what not to do. Why? We have now shifted part of the frame where we're seeing like the right hand side of a sphere where we're up so high. The problem is, is the world doesn't really tilt like this. It does when you're looking at a sphere. And if you're drawing spherical perspective, which is five point perspective, which I got to say, I made a comment a couple weeks ago an instructor heard me say something about five point and they're all, well, nothing's really in five point. That's ridiculous. That's fantasy land. And I looked at him. I said, dude, you're standing on the earth. If you pulled out from a satellite and we're looking down on the earth or had a really tall structure on the earth and you're looking down on it, the earth would be in five point perspective because it's round. We're not living on a on a square plane, right? We don't sail off the end of the, end of the earth. OK, you don't realize it because you're much smaller okay so there's a problem here the one of the problems is is look you have a vanishing point here where these buildings receding down then you have the a vanishing point going this way then you have a vanishing point going this way and here's the catch once you cross this dotted line here you see where my cursor is going there should be another vanishing point then receding to the far right that would be the spherical perspective that's a whole another lecture for another time okay Let's talk about what to do and what makes sense. Okay, that's a good shot. Now I can argue a little bit on the detail or some other elements, but this is what happens when your, your horizon line is placed low and you're looking at something in a vertical frame. And so you have left and right, you have two vanishing points on the base here. Here's your horizon line down about here. Do you see that? And to be honest, this is a little bit goofy down here. It's a little off because if the horizon line was right here in the middle, Okay, and that was going downward. We'd be able to see on top of it if it was under the horizon line. But then here we can see underneath this. Do you catch that? So if the horizon line's about right here, let's just say that it is. Okay, and we're looking upwards this way. This drawing, for the most part, is drawn re pretty correctly and looks pretty good. Okay, so we have the side of this building receding to vanishing point VP1 on the left. VP2 is on the right. And then as it goes upwards, there is a vanishing point that is about an inch and a half off the paper, which is the third vanishing point. Those are the three points, okay? So a little rule of thumb here. When you want to draw and side three point perspective correctly and have an upshot or a downshot, you need to make sure you're going in opposite direction of your horizon line, giving yourself enough room to expand. If you don't do that, you're gonna get a compressed drawing that looks incorrect and doesn't look right, okay? Next shot here, aha, this is when a pro starts to use it. So this is Nicolas Bouvier, right? This is Spark, all right? If you wanna go out and do anything, buy all three of his books. They're not that expensive. They have great examples of perspective, rendering, lighting, stage, and composition. I've mentioned this before in a couple of my lectures. He's a master. He knows what he's doing, okay? Now, technically, this drawing is two point and it's tilted, do you see that? However, though, if these angles were to go any higher of these buildings, he would start to converge them a little bit. So this is a good example. This is really a drawing that's done in two-point perspective that's been tilted. However, though, the part that makes it three-point a little bit is this. I'm going to show you. You see, if you know perspective good enough, you see the ellipses right here? Okay? Those ellipses have a major and a minor axes. The major axis is going from this point here to that point there. And as that major axis goes through, do you see what it's doing? It's going up to a third VP. And look at the side of the wing here. You see the side of the wing here, and you see this little lips here? If I go through there, through there, through the major axis, and that line hits that wing, that's converging up to a third vanishing point. This is why Sparth is a pro, because he has the lower section is the, of this world is pretty much in two point. And then he knows once you start going up a little bit more, you're getting more length, allowing the convergence to happen. And he was therefore drawing part of that ship starting to converge a little bit into the third vanishing point, 
which is way, way off the page. Look at the lines here. You see that line? If I can, I'm gonna, I, I, you can't see my ruler, but if I put my ruler here and go down this side line and then go down this side line, and if you were to measure the distance from here to here and there to there, it looks like it's starting to pinch and get a little bit smaller here than here. That's him starting to pinch a little bit of the ship as he's going way, way above the horizon line and is starting to recede to another vanishing point. Okay, all right, here's another great piece. Okay, so how do we know this is in three point? Well, it's a tough one, but if you look at it like this, start with a base cube shape. This side of the cube recedes this way down to a vanishing point. Okay, this side recedes to, I can't talk today, excuse me. Someone is already busting my chops for saying foliage or foliage or not saying it in the right pronunciation. I get it. You guys are right. Sometimes I speak real fast on my lectures and I'm amped on coffee. And so let's look at the foliage, the tree. Anyway, let's get back to this. So um, good times, right? So look, this goes to the left, a vanishing point. Okay, right here. This technically is going to a vanishing point down here, but then you have some of these. Look, that goes to a VP. That goes to that VP. Technically, looking at this, most of this is in two point on a Dutch tilt. However, then you have these lines. You see these lines? These lines that are going down this way, those lines are also matching to another vanishing point. So technically, see that? There are three different sets of lines. You have lines going this way, you have lines going into the center of the screen, and then you have these other lines, these vertical lines here. Technically speaking, if you pull out a ruler and check, most of those lines are pretty parallel to each other, which means this is really just a two-point perspective drawing, okay? But I'm indicating to you that it looks like it's three-point because there's a little bit of a tilt and an action there, which there could be an argument here where some of that angle of that line is starting to converge in a little bit more because Sparth has drawn enough thumbnails that once you get to the outside line there, you start to put a little bit of an angle, bit of a twist on side your drawing. A lot of artists do that that have been have the mileage, okay? So yes, this is two point, but there is a teeny bit of three point starting to happen in it, okay? All right, next shot here. Come on, PowerPoint, there it goes, all right? The amazing Rob Rupel, okay? Do you see that you have structures in here? This converges downward to a, a horizon line, to a vanishing point. The side of this converges downward. So your horizon line is way down under the frame of this image, correct? Right, correct. However, though, look at the buildings. So structures are receding up to a vanishing point. That vanishing point is going to be way off the page, okay? It's much higher. So you can see these transition lines here. You can see it in the waterfall. And then you can see them start to level out in the middle right here where you almost get a straight line about right there. And then as you continue to go to the right side of that line, you're gonna see more of angles becoming present, especially here in the structures, which are going to that upper third vanishing point, okay? Next, aha, this is where your skills really kick in, okay? Um, I found this as development art from uh, Monsters 2. Um, I don't know if John Navarez did this or not, his buddy of mine who worked up there at Pixar for a little bit, um, but I just saw this and I'm like, man, that's a great shot. So first of all, before the, so I need to go over a couple basics with you, which I don't mean to skip. One thing that's, that's hard about being a teacher is you're lecturing, you have subject matter to give, you're talking, trying to communicate points. At the same time, you're also trying to plan ahead to the future slides. So in three-point perspective, one of the things you need to be stopping and asking yourself at all times is where exactly is my horizon line? If you don't put the horizon line in and you just start drawing, you've automatically failed because you make it that much more complex on top of yourself because you have to have an understanding. So looking at this, I can see on top of everything in here, you know your horizon line is off page and it is up high somewhere, okay? The next thing you need to do is determine where your two key vanishing points are, your VP1 and your VP2, okay? So if you look over here, you can see that this is transitioning over here to a point. So you're gonna have one vanishing point over here and you can see the beams right here that are sort of transitioning over to that other vanishing point, right? The same vanishing point. Then you have the side of this, which are going to another vanishing point way off the page here. And look at this, look at the side of this support beam right here. That's going to a vanishing point. That's going to a vanishing point. So you can identify that there's one VP about here. 
there's another VP off the page. Those are your two main vanishing points off your horizon line. Then you have the third vanishing point, which is us either looking down or up, and that's the convergent vanishing point that establishes it as three-point perspective. Look at the chair legs. Their chair legs are pointing down. That's going downward. Okay, look at this vertical um, chandelier holder thing, imajigger, right here. The line's going down, and it's going down to a vanishing point. Look at the detail here. Look at the candles. Those are all pointing down to that third vanishing point off the page. Okay, beautiful drawing, by the way. Okay, next. All right, here's another awesome image by Sparth. Okay, hmm, where's the, what's happening here now? It's funny, I'd like to grab one of these and tilt them back. So technically, one of my students, one of my advanced students recently, he took a bunch of Sparth images and he turned them up. And you notice that the majority of them, some of them are in two point, but there's a Dutch tilt happening. Well, th that's correct, but you also have to look at the little subtleties that Sparth knows. For example, you know, you can see you have a square shape here, right? So that, that part of that square shape is going back this way to a vanishing point. Another part of it's coming back in here to a point where all this is converging to, down about in here. But then also look at the ships. You see this building here? That building is wider at the base and then gets thinner at the top. Somebody might argue, well, that's the way he designed it. Well, it also can be the convergence receding away. Because if we look up here and you look at the base of that ship, and if you go up here, you see how the ship gets narrower and it starts to get a little bit thinner, okay? Well, that's part of that third point. So there's actually multiple points in here and one of the great things about being a good draftsman is that you have the ability to not only in, interpret perspective but you have the ability to embellish on top of it and that means you can add things or add multiple objects multiple perspective to make the drawing look a little bit more enhanced okay which is cool right like i used to say you know um, in athletics that's what you train for right that's what you guys doing these thumbnail sketches, filling up your notebook, drawing things from multiple angles, building up your visual memory to draw is you training. So when you get to that position of a viz dev artist or a concept artist or a layout designer, you can go in there and kill it and you can do what the script requires you to do. Okay, next. All right. Uh, yeah, definitely three point. Okay, look at the exaggeration. Look at what's happening to those ellipses. Is it stretching across, okay? So I talk about this quite often in my applied perspective class. One of the ways that we learn how to draw ellipses correctly is we draw the square that they exist in. We divide that square up and we, found, we find the circumference of that elliptical angle, which is also known as a degree angle uh, of a ellipse inside a square, okay? And if you come over here and you look at this, you can have a good idea so this is not only three point, but it also has a Dutch tilt where we have an angle down here, we're looking up. And as we look up, what's gonna happen is the angle of the ellipse is going to get greater. And we can see that. This angle of this ellipse here is a lot smaller. As we go a step up, that's getting greater. We go up to here, that's getting even greater. And then you go up to the very top and that's even greater, okay? So right there is, this is like quadruple three point. Just kidding. But there's a lot happening here. So if you look at that, look at this. This square that that ellipse exists in has a vanishing point down there, has a vanishing point down there, right? Then you have, ready for this? You have the length of these. See that? See that? Receding to another vanishing point. See that? Then you have the ships. Height and relationship receding to another point closer in the frame where it's, it's larger here and then gets smaller as it recedes. So the thing is, you have to imagine this. You're looking at, you're standing on a cliff, you're looking down on that cliff, or you might be actually, in this example, you're down low looking up at these giant buildings, okay? Imagine if you took a long broomstick. You could turn that broomstick into multiple angles looking from your eye, point of view, and depending on the angle of that broomstick, you're gonna see it recede and get smaller. So technically inside what I call the world of perspective or like a 3D world, and you can do this in Maya very easily. You can take a camera, set it on the grid plane, and then you can take something very long and tilt it to multiple angles. It'll still give you the illusion of a third vanishing point because the length of that broomstick would be converging as it recedes away from you. Okay, which is one of, there in my applied perspective class, I like to save a lot of those good lectures for just the students in that class. I don't put them up online. 
okay? But one of their three governing rules of perspective, one of the key governing rules is as items recede away from you, they always get smaller. End of story, okay? All right, next. Okay, beautiful art here by Rob Ruppel. Okay, so look at where the horizon line is. It's down low in the frame. It's a vertical composition because it allows us from this point to get more longevity and length with the item receding away to their third vanishing point, which is way off the page. Extremely important, okay? So one of my students came up with notice once when we were talking in class and said, well, technically, Phil, isn't like when everything's right in front of you on a horizon line and the horizon line's in the middle of the frame, the world's in one point and two point, and then once you go vertical up or down, then the world is going into three point. I said, well, that's exactly it. You nailed it. When buildings recede away from you and go further away, they have to converge to a vanishing point because they're receding away from the stationary point or the viewer's point where you're looking at them, right? It's the same thing if you go down. If I came in here and if I cut a line in here and had a giant cliff and then extended the frame down and we could see down on that cliff, that cliff would start to converge away from me as it recedes away. And that's exactly how you sort of have to look at three-point perspective and how it works. However, though, what happens when you get into staging? Aha! That's where this is key, is low angle shots look great. Okay, a character's coming up into a castle. I mean, look at that shot. Is she there to go in there and give hugs and kisses to people? No. What is she there to do? Kick ass and take names, okay? That's what that angle is setting you up for. That's important. Why is that important? Uh, I'm a Maya artist and I'm working, doing pre -vis animation and I'm setting up locations animating with a Maya camera. And then I have that conversation with a student. What's your perspective ability? What's your understanding of perspective? Um, I, I don't really need it because I have Maya to figure it out for me. No, nope, sorry, you fail. Let's hire the next artist. No, you have to have an understanding of composition and composing and, and be able to set up stories and know how to tell stories. Where do the camera angles go when a villain is going to do something, right? You have to be able to draw this and storyboard this out, then be able to figure it out in a pre -vis sense. That way it goes to the finished 3D model so you can model it correctly and stage it correctly. That's a beautiful shot, isn't it? That's one of the ones you wanna put up, print out, put up above your art desk so you can look at it, draw on top of it, right? Look at all, look at that, look at the angle there to a VP, okay? You have the side angles here going to a VP. And you have, look at this line going up, third vanishing point, third vanishing point. Look at that tilt back here, okay? Is there a cone of vision inside a three point upshot or downshot? Absolutely there is. There is a point where, see right here that building? If you keep drawing any more buildings over here, they're gonna to start to look like this at an angle. They're gonna be almost sideways. That's gonna throw it off. You're outside of the cone of vision. I had a recent instructor, a student told me a recent instructor here had said that there is no perspective inside environments, just paint foreground over midground and background. And I was like, what? Obviously you don't know, have any understanding of how to stage and separate out planes and tell stories because perspective is a really, really huge part of that, right? Okay, so here's a cool shot. Horizon line's about right here. I'm expect expecting most of your shots that you're gonna thumbnail out to look somewhat similar to this. Where you have a frame like this, it's horizontal. Your horizon line is in the lower section of the frame about right here, okay? And you have, this artist has one vanishing point here inside the frame. The other vanishing point is way off the frame. And then you see these lines going vertical, especially right here. Now that's tilted a little bit, a little bit of a cheat, but if you go off the main building, it's going to a vanishing point in this direction. So is that going, and then so is the side. You see the lines right here and here, and especially over here. Those are all going to a vanishing point, which are about two to four frames off the page right there, okay? talk about opening establishing shots there's the example look at that batman overlooking gotham city where's the focal point in there folks huh wait ladder right it's right here it's a capital batman's pointing to it the buildings are pointing to it 
The street points to it. Contrast points to it. Dark against light, dark against light. The colors point to it. There's blues against orange right there. You see that? Batman's an important part of the silhouette, but if this artist wants us to look right at Batman, you would need to put a blue or orange light around Batman to get him to pop. There's not. There are blue and orange lights down here, which are complementary colors, and that's why your eye ends up going down there. And also, we just had a lecture today on lighting and, you know, excuse me, a critique today on your two-point perspective drawings looking at the light. And again, biggest area of contrast and most amount of light and detail. All the detail in the light here, look at that, orange lights on top, cool lights. All this, look, all this pepperized detail right up in here. Yes, sir. No, you can't have a character in yours. You gotta learn how to draw the environment correct first, and then you can have a character in it later. That's why this summer I'm writing four classes just to focus on digital narrative, digital illustration and the digital narrative. Understanding how to tell stories with a character inside a scene. But you can't get into that. That's like when you jump ahead, you know, it's like being on the swim team and you don't want to do all the practices, but you just want to jump in the race. It doesn't work that way. All right, got to give it time. Mail the environments first. All right, next. All right, look at that. Pretty cool, extreme looking upshot, right? So you have a vanishing point here. Okay, right here in the frame. You have another vanishing point where this recedes back down to here on the horizon line. And then you have the third vanishing point where all the buildings go to you. So I'll draw for you in a couple minutes and I'll add it on to the lecture. That's what you sort of have to do when you're working in three point. Is you need to figure out, that's exactly what I do. I throw the horizon line in. And I already have a couple of demos up. I have a demo for when I was teaching on the side at CGMA up here where I'm drawing a three point down shot. I can, I should, figure out how to link that demo into this demo so you can see me doing it when I'm sketching and drawing, okay? But yeah, you just start with a couple key points and that's it. Those points build off. If you ignore those points, you fail, okay? We're gonna get to important subject matter in a couple minutes here, talking about some other artists that rely off of grids all the time, okay? Look at this shot, another great shot. Um, I don't know who did this. I just found it, it was you know work from Uncharted 2. Um, I, it could be Feng Zhu. It could also be um, uh, Naughty Dog. I don't know if the, I think they worked on Uncharted 2 as well. It could be Rob Rupel. But whoever it is, thank you for letting us look at your beautiful artwork. It's absolutely amazing. And not only is this a three-point shot, okay, which Jared isn't here, but I wanted to mention this to Jared. J this is Jared's environment he just did. Look at how we're on the interior. Jared. Did I say Jared? Jarek. Did I say Jared? I'm sorry. Sam. My, my brain focuses on one thing only. My wife always tells me that. I, really, it does. I focus on the lecture. I screw up names, pronunciations, and stuff all the time. Okay, so Jarek, okay. Uh, Jarek, look at the tone values out here. You see the buildings in the back? You barely see them. See how light they are? He's not here, by the way. He stepped out. I'm just saying this because he's going to watch the video tonight at home. Okay, but these tone values are very, very light back there. Why? The light's coming in. The light is coming through here, bouncing off hitting these edges, and then bouncing back into other objects around this environment. It's a beautiful light study. It's very nicely done. That's a great transition. If you suck at line drawing, do you know what you do? You take this image right here, you, you, you cut it in half right here, okay? You put that other half on another piece of paper and look at it, then you draw the line of what is here, and then you go back and repaint over it, having to match it match the light and the condition of the values being set by that light source coming from outside. That's how you learn how to paint really quick. Okay, it's fantastic. A friend of mine taught me that when I was a big idea. A painter, his name is Chuck Vollmer, a fellow painter who had worked at Disney for numerous years and I was sitting next to him at Big Idea and um, he made a comment to me, you wanna learn how to really paint really well? Take any photo or any other rendering or tonal from somebody else cut it in half and paint the other half, matching the existing half that you're looking at on a piece of paper. It teaches you how to understand gradients and flow of light, darkness and shadows. Absolutely right, okay? Beautiful stuff right there, okay? All right, let's jump over here to the next photo. Look at that, another amazing one. This is um, James Pack, by the way, who might have done the other one. No, it probably did because it says property of Naughty Dog. So 
Uh, James is a local artist, also teaches at Concept Design Academy, a couple other schools. Uh, amazing designer, has a beautiful sense of lighting and understanding tone and values. A another art center guy who's extremely talented and really good at what he does. Look at the light values back here as you go up by that art, uh, excuse me, by the light and these, I meant to say that part of the overlap of compositions over here, and then look at that light stringing down here, and then look at the light hitting the ground. Primary reads, secondary reads, look at that beautiful light surrounded by dark, and look at how the light breathes into here where you can see this front side here, you can see a back side here, and the light is bouncing throughout part of this composition, hitting other elements, so not only is it a beautiful light study, look at the three-point perspective as well. This box converges to a VP off to the right. Another VP is over here to the left, while all these other verticals inside the composition are converging to the third and utmost vanishing point off the page. Okay, excellent work, right? Okay. Now, is that three point or two point? It's a good question. That's a tough one. Because if you look at it, and if I draw a line from the center of that building, it feels like it is going a little bit to the right, tilting a little bit to me. So to me, I look at that. That is the start of a drawing that's been done in two point. And as it's receding down lower, it's starting to get a little bit of bend to it. Okay, Because I get this feel down here. I have a little bit of an angle right there. Do you see that? That's angling down. That's going to a VP. Look at this, the line from here. It goes down, that's also going downward, going into a little bit of a third vanishing point. So that's a really subtle sort of two-point perspective drawing that's starting to recede into a third point. And again, look at that horizon line in there. Boom. So as you guys go home and you start working on three-point perspective, okay, and you start to struggle a little bit, one of the secrets, and I was going to get to this at the end, but I'll mention it now, one of the secrets is pulling up a drawing like this, looking at it, copying the perspective but not the buildings inside draw the perspective that's there understand what's happening by doing what we call a trace over trace over it find the vanishing points then come back and add in your own subject matter once you've nailed the points down you have to understand where the points are to be able to draw it correctly okay all right what about this one is this three point or is this two point it's another tough one Well, the majority of this is in two point. I thought I'd show it to you because when you start to get up here, you start to feel like there's maybe a little bit of angle starting to happen between the vertical lines. But I checked it with a ruler and most of these are pretty vertical. But you can see how easily if you wanted to, after you hit about just slightly over that horizon line, you can start converging a couple of these angles to a third vanishing point. It'd be about three frames off the page and it would start to go into sort of that feel of three points. So what's neat about this drawing to me is it is in two point, but you can see how to add a little bit more or pulling your frame up would start to engage it into a three point perspective drawing, okay? Check this one out, this one's gorgeous, All right? Look at that, cool, okay? Is this in three point or is this in two point? You have to sort of look at it and you have to analyze it, right? So let's take what you know. You know the horizon line's right here, okay? You know that there's one point there, there, because these buildings go to it, right? Also, if you look over here, this is going to another point way off the page. You see that? And the side of this is angling that way. So there's two points right there. And if I come in here and look, look at that angle. Is that going, looks like it's going down. This looks like it's starting to convert. It's going not just straight down, but it's starting to angle a little bit. You see that? And here's where I really caught it, right here. See this? This is angling in, going from my right side, going towards my left, angling down. See that? So what this artist did is the majority of this drawing from here to here is in two-point perspective. And then once the height of the buildings start to get in here, you can see it here a little bit. You see this is becoming slightly angled, where it's starting to angle down to a third vanishing point. Okay? All right? Just... I think it's important to look at it where you see it happening and how people are using it. That's obviously a three-point upshot. Horizon line is low. It could be even a little bit lower. Or an alleyway. And you have one point in the middle. Now, here's a tough one. And one of my students said, technically, isn't that just a two-point perspective drawing? 
because on this, there's one vanishing point in the middle. The other vanishing point is way off the page. The other vanishing point, you see this angle here, is way off the page in this direction, way off to the left. So technically, if you were to redraw this, it could be a two-point perspective upshot, which would mean one vanishing point in the middle, but all the lines would have to be horizontal in here. Since they're not, it's a three-point upshot, okay? You just have one VP in the middle, one way off the end here, okay? All right, if you had a cutout inside any of these buildings that allowed us to see way over here to the right side, you would then start to see this be at an angle and it would recede to a vanishing point going in this way, which means you would now have one point over here, one point in the middle, one point on the far left side, and one point up above where everything converging, which if you add is now four, four point, I can't talk, it's now four point perspective. That is the beginning example of how we would get to a four point perspective, which is sort of a convex view at looking at a spherical object, okay, where we have a point in the middle, a point on the left, a point on the right, and a point up at the top. Not many people can draw in four point perspective correctly. Okay, very few people can. Something to think about. At least now you've been introduced to it, and now you can question where you might see it. Okay? All right? Cool shot here. Excellent shot. Okay, three point perspective down shot. Boom. You have just take a square, you have this square here. That's going to vanishing point way over there. That side goes to a point way over here. And the rest of all these are merging to a vanishing point right inside the frame. Okay? We're down to a couple more slides. Okay? Really cool shot there. Look at that. Cool photo reel or 3D rendered. Nicely done. Okay? You have this building. Count the points. That building goes down. So you know your horizon line is somewhere down pretty low. It's actually, if this is going up, your horizon line is about right here. See that? It's the straightest line inside the composition. Straight line there, because this side of the road is going to a point off the page here. And then this is going to another point inside the page. Do you see that? So there's one point there in the page, another point off to the right, and then look at this. That structure, these windows, the side of this building, we're sitting up to that third point. Okay. Nice piece. All right, how about this one? I think this is also James Pack. Another wonderful tonal illustration here. This is why I tell, I always have students that want to jump into color. I always tell them like, we're not jumping into anything. You got to slow down and be able to master your understanding of working in black and white. It's not just Phil saying that. The American illustrators did it, okay? Um, the German, or I should say the European masters did it, okay? You have to be able to produce work at this caliber in black and white. There's an old saying I'm gonna tell you, and it's one of my favorite sayings ever. I tell it to students all the time. But then they wanna jump right into color, and I'm like, okay, look, color gets all the credit, but values do all the work. If you don't understand how color translates to values, and you can't work in a value set in terms of digital painting and understand how dark and light works, there's going to be a problem. So some of you have weaknesses, like I was talking to Everett a little bit earlier today, and I said, Everett, your weakness is understanding how light casts inside a room and how it hits objects and relates to them. You have to get used to how to render and be able to show the variation of light. For example, you can look at this piece. A great task for you to do, Everett, would be to take this piece, put it in Photoshop, draw the top half of it, remove it so you only have the line drawing, and then paint the rest of it in. It would be a great way to work. I think I just need to sit down with you, show you a couple brushes, and show you how to blend and paint and get that transition happening in there. And then you'll do it one time, you'll figure it out, and then Everett's going to come back like this super badass of, of tonal studies. So that's what happens. You get introduced into this. When I was first started in the industry, thanks to Michael Spooner and Robert St. Pierre, and um, actually our soon-to-be guest resident here, Sam Mitchlap, a couple classes that I took from people, being exposed to them and seeing them work, I fell in love with tone. And I realized that, wow, I knew a lot about tone, 
how it works and if I can get those transitions to to come into my linear drawing I was going to be able to set up mood and set up feeling inside work and that was going to really establish and allow me to move into another part of my industry and it did I would get hired to work just doing tonal studies or to go over people's boards and to set up the lighting and, and the indication of the values which is also known as workbooking okay I started getting jobs doing that quite a bit so you know James Pack here is a master at it look at how light the values are on the back he doesn't want you to look back there everything fades back and look at the sense of light here's light at its purest look at the light fading down across the values and we talk about light fading I remember I made a comment to you that there's always a light source and then you have two forms of a gradient after that light source you have light hitting objects that's going through a gradient as the light diminishes and then you have the dark side of objects which is doing the opposite it's going through a dark gradient from where the light had hit that and then it's going into a dark gradient of the shadow so you need to think of light and when we talk about three-point lighting and I talk about working with a rendering class I really refer to it as more as you have a key light one key light source and then you have two gradients you have the gradient of the light transitioning across objects and then you have the dark gradient of the objects transitioning back to their shadow which where there is no light so here's an example of that so you see the light transitioning in a gradient form casting along the side of that building right here you see look at the light here transitioning at its brightest going down and getting lighter see it excuse me going down and getting darker to a gradient here so that's a, a good examples of light transitioning but what happens when you're in a shadow area in the shadow area the dark values dominate so because of that you already have the dark values and you have a gradation of going from dark to light and here's an example of that here you are in the dark you see that now you have a gradient getting lighter 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 as you get up to here this value here is about a seven or eight that value down here is a ten that's the opposite so in real light conditions and working with tone you have the key light source and you have two sets of gradients you have to think of without those gradients your image falls apart because the human eye and the human brain needs to see a form of gradient pass happening for you to understand what are the lighting conditions these are the lighting conditions you have seen since being a child and the lighting conditions you still see today even as you walk out of here in fact speaking of that look at the room that you're in now 80 percent of the lights are off the key light source is coming from there i can look across this back wall and i see light gradating across to a darker dark because of the influence of light coming from the classroom next to us right right okay same thing's happening in this piece all right that's why this guy is a master Let's get at what he does, okay? Talk with students, and I get this all the time. I just don't know how to learn three-point perspective. Answer, sketchbook. Practice repetition. Nothing's easy when you first start, okay? All right? Learn to be able to stage from your mind and your visual memory, okay? And then I get this from students. I got a Photoshop brush, bro and it does like grids and three point instantly. I just use my Photoshop brush, my grid. Okay, if you use grids that are predetermined for you, I've seen it happen in the workplace. I worked with a guy who would roll out a grid and draw on top of it every time. And the only difference between now and then is now we've switched completely to digital. So you have the same thing. There are Photoshop brushes that are grids. Everyone's eyes just perked up, right? But here's the problem, is you are limited to the angles inside those grids, okay? If you use a Photoshop brush and it throws down the lines for you, good luck ever making anything new or different or composed from a different angle. You're not gonna be able to because grids become a crutch. What is a crutch? A crutch is something that does not enable you, you use that crutch and you have to learn how to walk or run with it, right? The right way to learn it is to go into your sketchbook and to start drawing small little compositions and be throwing around three vanishing points all over. Hence, that comes back to mileage. The more mileage you have, the more practice, the more repetition, that is how you get better at understanding how to apply and use three-point. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. If you picked up a, a, a trumpet or a saxophone, you wouldn't be able, you could just blow into it. It's going to sound like crap, but it's going to take 
months for you to learn how to play some notes and how to pull a song together. It's the same thing with drawing in, in three point. So I'm going to give you this little warning, little piece of advice here. In our classroom, we have Centiques here, right? Because we rock. No. As you go to draw on your Centique, if you start to draw on an 8.5 by 11 or 11 by 17 piece of paper, really large, you're going to drown yourself because you did not do your drawing small. I want you to do, we only have two and a half weeks of school left. I want you to draw, okay, at a smaller size, figure out what's working and not working, take the ones that are working and then extrapolate off of that and move forward. If you do not do that, you're going to be screwing yourself up because you're going to be designing at a larger size. And designing at a larger size is nothing that I ever taught you to do in this class. I taught you to draw small and think big. Do thumbnails, figure out your angles, take the ones that are working, do multiple thumbnails, then go large and blow it up. Luckily with digital, we can do that pretty easy, okay? Don't create a crutch, don't go right into Photoshop grids. You know, you're never gonna create an interesting angle by doing that. You have to learn how to draw it yourself, okay? All right, next here. I'm waiting for it to turn, but sorry, the video recorder. So how do I learn three-point perspective? Just go on the internet and type in three-point perspective photos, type in three-point perspective concept art, and up will come up a ton of images. And something we do in my applied perspective class is we, I make you create, excuse me, I, I make you take images and do what are called traceovers. For example, you can take this right here, you can draw on top of this right now, and you can find where the vanishing points in the horizon line are, right? You take that image and draw and find that perspective, then go back, create a vertical frame on top of that image, throw in new buildings, and stage accordingly. You got it? Okay. So what we do in art and drawing is that we're not all masters in the beginning. Okay. You have to learn how to stage and set something up. To do that efficiently and correctly, we mimic. We look at other people's artwork. We look at their compositions. Now, I'm not telling you to steal this drawing. I'm telling you to copy part of the perspective in here. Know where the vanishing points are. Know where the third point is. Then go back and restage on top of that. Then go back into that and build your own drawing accordingly. Does that make sense? Use that as a guidance and as stepping stones to get yourself. So if you're one of my students that's going to go home between now and next class and over the weekend and you're going to do thumbnails and you're struggling on your thumbnails and you come back in here and your horizon line is in the middle of every thumbnail which is when i want to take my cattle prod out and shock you okay because you didn't listen to anything right because we already talked about the horizon line should be either up high or down low right okay in perspective class high perspective i even give you multiple tips on how to make the drawing work but that's sort of my golden secret that comes from 16 years of drawing experience of working in studios, you know, that I don't always just hand out. I like to share that with my students one on one, but I got to make you struggle for it and fight for it a little bit. Right. You have to get in there and be able to draw. So you, you go draw over a drawing like this, you figure out what's happening and then you add your own elements. Now, one thing I want to leave you with inside a three point perspective drawing, whether upshot or downshot you still have foreground, midground, and background. So you still have to be conscientious about those items as you are drawing. We've, ordered a, we've already discussed those items in one point and two point, but that is what happens from this point forward, right? So if you think about it, if you look at this, see that tree? That's foreground, folks. If I brought my frame down to show where the horizon line is meeting at the base, what else could I show then if I lowered my frame? a car, a mailbox, right? An old newspaper stand, an old school telephone, you know, the kind you put the quarters in, right? I could add other elements once I hit that ground plane, right? So I could introduce other elements in the foreground. What's my midground? My midground right now is that building. And, and you could technically say that these are also midground behind it. Or you could say those are background. And on top of it, we even have another background, which is the sky plane, the sky background. What are inside skies? Birds, clouds, blimps, other things, right? So I could address, I could also have an upper sky plane then that I can address in terms of perspective. 
all those elements need, need to be filled. Usually when students start sketching three-point perspective, if I'm lucky, I get foreground, I usually get midground, and then I get no background, and then I get no sky plane. Those are all elements that add towards that environment becoming realistic and making sense. In fact, if you're to go back into the rest of everything else, that's what you would notice, okay? The next phase, but we've already moved to the next phase a part of this, but thumbnailing and sketching. You should start off, number one, you should have a frame. Number two, I already told you, where's your horizon line, okay? Number three, correct position of your vanishing points. You need to jot them down. If you have to take one piece of eight and a half by 11 paper to do one three point drawing because your vanishing points are really low and then one's really high, then do it. You can't come back and draw on this with frames right next to each other. You sort of have to give yourself a little bit more space to draw on top of until you have the drawing mileage to understand where the points are, okay? I just mentioned this. Next phase, establish dedicated foreground, midground, and background. That's a principle of composition that deals with overlapping. When you have overlap of shape and perspective, you create depth, okay? Next thing is you need to, in three point, I'm giving you all the directions here, folks, right? I'm settling it for you. You can take a copy of this and put it right by your art desk or your computer. Next, as you start to block in shapes, you have to set scale. And then you have to check the scale. How do I set scale? If I draw a box for a building and put a frame on that for a window, I've now set scale. If I put an environment with a box in it and I draw a street sign, I've set scale inside my piece, okay? Next thing, design. Now we need to start thinking about how are we designing? It's a little bit of composition in there, right? I know this is an introductory class to environment sketching, but we've already been talking about design quite a bit. Composition, about overlap, about transitions, about groupings, about visual reads and silhouettes, using shape language, all those important elements start to come together. The next thing to throw at you, which we just finished talking about in this class, right? Eden, we just covered this in yours. Where exactly is your focal point? Right? So figure out where you want us to look. Now, it's not just one point, two point. We have a third point moving us throughout the composition. So if it's a three point down shot and you're, and you're working on Batman the Brave and the Bold and you're taking me down, looking downward towards a bank that Joker's going to rob and I'm looking from Batman's point of view, your horizon line better be high and better be, better be looking downward with a three point building, you know, with a three point shot with that bank at the center of that focus of the third point, right? Right. Focal point, okay? Uh, contrast. Large shapes, round shapes, square shape, small shape, opposites, okay? And then we'll get into tone and direction of light. That's a little bit harder, okay? Right now I'm going for just the line drawing to work. And then if we have time to squeeze that in, which we do, you have, you guys have, after you have this week, next week, and the week after, I think you basically have three weeks of school left to get this done, okay? Your goal, today's a work day, when I finish this demo, or this lecture, excuse me, and then you have the rest of Thursday to draw, and I would say come back in here, be prepared to have a minimum of, I'd say, seven to 10 thumbnails up on the wall. Why a little bit more this time? Well, usually we do about seven to 10, but maybe even 10 to 15, why? I guarantee you, your first time drawing in three-point perspective, you're gonna have a 30 to 40% fail rate on drawings that don't look right. That's normal. Remember, you gotta get, in order to get the good drawings out, you have to get the bad drawings out. That's what's gonna happen, right? There's nothing wrong with that, okay? And then our last thing to think about is emotion. What are you conveying? And this is more of an advanced topic, but what's your shape language? What's your building structures? You know what I mean? What's, is there something horrible that's gonna happen in your scene? How are you setting that up? Are there diagonals in there? I know that's more of an advanced topic in composing, but I just throw it out there. So if you happen to be doing your drawing, you could look back and think about it, okay? This is the problem solving phase of designing that every single artist displayed to you today has spent multiple years learning and applying. You need to understand that, okay? Multiple years, don't take it for granted, okay? Don't ever disrespect it, okay? Become a, a good designer, an artist has earned over time through knowledge, repetition, and application. It is not, if it's not working, then you have to do more, okay? Think it through. We never reach a final design in five thumbnails, do we? No. We reach it after 15 or 20, sometimes even 30 or 40 thumbnails of really nailing down what we're doing. We rough, we re, we, excuse me, 
we rough, we redraw, we reframe, and then we rethink. I should co coin that, the four R's of drawing, right? That's what we do, okay? All right, have fun. Start sketching. And remember, work small. Just because you have a Cintiq doesn't mean you should jump into a big, large drawing. You're going to drown yourself if you do that. Thank you, guys.